Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're going to try to be prompt. Um, and we got a lot to go over tonight. So um, we're going to start. We, uh, I don't see this. This is our third meeting. We do the same one, uh, but we try to do it in three different parts of the district. Um, the district is just so large. It's uh, geographically wise, a little over half of the land mass of the whole county uh, is um, actually a, the Verona district. So, you know, there's really like seven different pockets, if not more than that. But we started off last Monday at 10 a.m. at the Henrico Theater. And um, that was our Highland Springs portion. And then that same day in the evening, I think it was 630 at Seven Pines Elementary, um, which those residents who live in Sandston, um, they could, uh, you, you can come to any of the meetings, but those Sandston residents, Seven Pines, Elko and Sandston area. And then, you know, Verona proper, we're here in the John Rolfe area. Um, and so there's a rural, uh, rural Verona, suburban Verona, urban Verona. Um, but, but we are here tonight at John Rolfe. Each one of our meetings last week were two hours. Uh, we're not trying to be here two hours a night. Um, and so we made some tweaks to the schedule, but there is a lot that we want to share. And so uh, let me first say we welcome those of you who are in person and those who are online. And we're streaming this live online. And so we had uh, two decent sized groups um, uh, watching live at both meetings last week. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that there are people on right now. And so if you are watching online, there's a chat function. And so if you have questions, then you put them in the chat. The questions will get to me and then I will ask them so that everybody can hear them and then we'll get the responses um, from the appropriate persons that are giving a response. We're going to have a quick um, Keep Him Rico beautiful um, update and recruitment from Megan Brown. Recreation and Parks is going to come forward. Um, Torrance Archie, um, Julian Cherry, Kim Nesta, and whoever else is with the department, they'll all come and share. And then we're going to have a bond referendum presentation. We do have the bond referendum on the ballot now. Um, voting started September the 23rd, which was Friday before last. And um, through November the 8th, election day is November the 8th. And the bond we have four bond referendum questions. And so Monica Callahan and, and others um, will present those questions and give you a deeper look into what's on the bond referendum. And then our police chief is here. I just saw him walk in. Chief English is here. He's going to give us an uh, update um, on crime and whatever else he feels led to give an um, update on. Our director of planning is here, Joe Emerson, and he's going to talk about um, development um, projects that are either in the pipeline, um, uh, they're on the books, meaning they haven't been voted on by the planning commission or the board of supervisors um, or things that are, you know, developers are looking at, et cetera. So he has a piece that he's going to do, and then we're going to wrap up with public works. Our director of public works, uh, Terrell Hughes is here. And um, he's going to talk primarily about trucks um, and speeding. And we did a, a, um, a truck study in, in East of Henrico. And so we are happy because we've been, been studying that for a while. And we're going to be restricting a lot of road, truck traffic on roads um, here very soon. So he's going to talk about that. So Megan Brown is going to come. And then after Megan, if there aren't any questions, Recreation and Parks will come. So. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Nelson. My name is Megan Brown. I'm the executive coordinator of Keep and Rico Beautiful. I have, I'm going to be very brief. I have a quick update for you. Um, every year we give out the Land Lover and Clean Business Awards. And with those awards, we're celebrating sustainable practices that people employ with their yard management or a business might employ. 
And usually we accept those nominations during the month of April, but we have opened those nominations um, for anyone to submit an application year round. So we're hoping that makes it a little bit easier for residents um, who want to apply to get their application in because they don't have to remember to do it just in the month of April. But we're looking for people who might use rain barrels or compost or have permeable pavement in on their properties. And we really want to celebrate you. So you can find those applications and past awards at Henrico KHB dot org. And then um, another quick update. We have the land lovers series with the libraries and there's two coming up. Um, in the fall, uh, two more, one in October and then two in November in Oct on October 29th at 11 a.m. at Libby Mill Library. We have bats among us where we'll have a biologist from the Department of Wildlife Resources there. And then we have native plants for backyard habitats on November 5th at 2 p.m. at the Fairfield Library and Thursday, November 10th at 3 p.m. at the Gaten Library. So my email um, is up on the slide, bro172 at henrico.us. Please email me anytime. We'll leave that up for a second if you're trying to get it. I don't know if they can see it online, but for those of you who are watching here, um, and we thank um, Ms. Brown and uh, her team. We, are, we do need someone to fill uh, Linda Thompson served uh, on the Keeping Rico Beautiful Committee, and she had to resign for some personal reasons. And so I do have an opening um, for this district for somebody to serve. So if you're here, you're watching online, and you want to participate, or you know someone um, that may be interested in this type of work, um, then get with me or, or call Ms. Brown and learn more, reach out, email um, about what the committee position will look like so that we can have full representation in Brown. So thank you, ma'am. Appreciate you. All right, we're going to turn this over to, well, I'm sorry, are there any questions uh, for Ms. Brown before we move on? All right, hearing none, um, we're going to move on to recreation and parks. And there's a lot going on with wrecking parks, so I'm going to ask the team to come on up. How y'all doing, everybody? I'm Torrance Archie. I'm the Assistant Director for Recreation and Parks. We do have a lot of things going on in Recreation and Parks in the county, but what we came to do today was share with you the things that's happening in your area, in your district. Is that cool with everybody? All right. I'm going to turn it over to Julian. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Charity. I'm the Division Director for History, Heritage, and Natural Resources. And uh, the first thing I want to share with you, what's going on with us, is we have the Dormer Farmers, Dory Park Farmers Market is, in, is finishing up its 2022 season. Uh, actually, this Saturday, we have our last Saturday concert scheduled. It's at 7 p.m. And the end of season fall festival is going to be October the 29th. We also have a S'mores and More community event going on at Clark Palmore on October the 23rd. Our fitness classes, Yoga in the Park, Extreme Hip Hop, Dory and at the Springs. Our Holiday Express Tour, uh, which is our, our parades where we go through neighborhoods coming up in early December. So we're actually taking suggestions from the public as to which neighborhoods to go through. Uh, um, one of our uh, kind of our operating um, ideas is to go from school to school and then have a place that Santa can actually interact with everyone. Uh, we also have some historic markers that are up uh, coming up uh, specifically there for Bungalow City, but also St. James uh, Church and the cemetery. Uh, and our HPAC Awards of Merit are coming up, so we're still taking nominations for that. Out at Dory Park, our spray park, we're actually looking to complete that within the next three to four weeks, just in time to make sure it works and then shut it down and get ready for the spring of 2023. So that's really exciting. I'm ready to jump in there myself. Then our Haunted Henrico Theater is going to be on October the 22nd. We are converting the Henrico Theater into a haunted house experience, also showing uh, three movies that day. And now we'll turn it over to Kim. How y'all doing tonight? 
One day I'm going to grow up and be as tall as these guys. <laughs> um, so the springs, how many people have been to the springs? A couple of you. We're going to remedy that for everybody else. So uh, in the spring of 22, we held a what we called Have Your Say Day. We wanted to hear from the community exactly what kind of events, programs, um, and amenities they wanted to see at the Springs. So we sent out postcards and got everybody's feedback. We also talked with the community at the event. And so as a result, uh, we were able to make some changes at that facility. Um, first being, we have added a art studio called Studio at the Spring. So we have a number of art classes, uh, mosaics, wood burning, acrylic painting, jewelry making, um, different woodworking or holiday arts and crafts. So all of those go on at that location. Um, and then we are developing a drop-in style program. So once you have taken a class, you are welcome to come back uh, when this facility is open and just work on a project um, utilizing some of our tools because we understand a lot of people don't want to purchase these things. They just want to have access to them. So you can see here a couple of the classes that have gone on, the wood burning, um, top right cutting some, some glass and shaving it down. And then the bottom right, we've got some of our staff building the props for which Julian just mentioned, uh, the haunted house coming up. Um, so that has already been implemented at the site, but we are looking to add more. So we have, are adding community rooms actually to a number of our different locations. We already have a very successful one out at Belmont Recreation. Um, it's been very well attended. It gives the kids and families a place to go and recreate uh, when the facilities are open. Um, so we've got a number of games in there, table set up, skee-ball, Pac-Man, uh, what else, pool tables, and then some of the new digital games. Uh, and I dare say the, the adults love it just as much. They're in there hooting and, and hollering. Um, it's also a great place for kids to come in, have access to the internet, and do homework. So really just a place that the community can go. Um, so we are implementing one. The top left is at Eastern Henrico. Um, and then we will also be housing one at the Springs. We are in the process of converting that location. The next room that we are looking to overhaul, um, we've got a space that we're implementing a music studio. Um, so we've got the soundproofing already in and some of the equipment. Um, so the goal here is to allow kids a, a different outlet to express themselves. Um, again, giving them another alternative for something to do. So we're partnering with HPAL on that. Um, and the gentleman in the middle, Baron specifically, he runs a curriculum for them currently. So they will come in, they'll learn how to even set up the equipment, get everything together, and then how to produce on it. Again, once they have taken those courses, they can then come in for drop-in times as well um, and create and produce music on their own. So we're helping to, to build on that and roll that out, hopefully before summer, so we can get the summer camp kids in there being able to utilize it. And then lastly, this is the big one. People have been asking for a playground at the Springs for a long time. And we're finally going to see that to fruition. Um, and it's a quite sizable playground. It's all, got all kinds of different types of slides, whirly gigs. Uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about is there are three different kinds of swings. So we've got the standard swings, um, but then we also have an ADA swing, as well as what we call generational swings. So no getting tired, pushing your kids on the swings. You'll actually get in the swing with them, facing them, and you're able to swing back and forth. So those are the amenities that we will be placing at the springs. This coming spring, we are going to do a have your say day at Dory also. With the spray park opening out there, we want to make sure that the inside is, is utilized. And so we'll, we'll look to hear from the community what they would also like to see there. All right, well, that brings us to Telephone Park. <clears throat> I know Kim says squirrely gigs. I've never heard that on the playground, so I don't know if any of you guys heard that before. It's a thing. Squirrely gigs, then. That was Go with that. Well, we have Taylor Park. If you're not familiar with Taylor Park, we're going to be having the um, construction bid going out in the next three to four weeks. I know you can't really see this, this plan, but I'm going to kind of go to the next slide to tell you some of the things that's going to be out there. <clears throat> that's a little better. 
Uh, we have neighborhood activities areas going to be in the uh, top left. We have neighborhood tr uh, tr nature trails, boardwalks, and discovery trails. It's going to be a pretty big park, a lot of green space, activity for sports. And when we say acti active sports, I'm sorry, we're talking about pump tracks and um, skateboard uh, ramps and everything out there. So if you've seen anything with our skateboard park over at Lower Park, you know this will be well accepted. And well, the kids are gonna love this, and not just the kids, but the older adults who like to skateboard too. So hopefully, see some of you guys out there. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sandston, off Route sixty. YMCA. Are you asking that question because you want to skateboard, or you just want to visit the park? There you go. <laughs> he wanted to do it squiggly, so. And then we have a recirculating pond that's going to go about 200 feet through the park so you can get in the water, out the water, have fun, splash around, whatever you want to do on that. Um, I know we mentioned the pump track. That's going to be part of it. And then we also have the, the skate park right there. And we're going to have shelters and, of course, upgraded bathrooms and things for you guys to take advantage of while you're at the park. <clears throat> the next thing we have is our Henrico Sports and Entertainment Authority. I know you've been hearing a lot of that throughout the news and what's going on with that part, but... They formed the subdivision in September, September 13th of this year. So that's in effect right now. So what we're looking to do is produce some revenue streams from sports and activities. So that's going to be a big part of sports and the sports authority that's going forward right now. Um, the next slide is going to show you just how much revenue we missed over since 2019. We're talking about $33 million that we've missed just from not having indoor sports. So we've been benefiting from outdoor sports, but we are building a new sports arena. If you're not familiar with that, over at um, BCC, so that's going to be a brand new arena that has 12 full-size NCAA double basketball, NCAA courts, and that's going to be able to produce 24 volleyball courts. So in the meantime, when that's not being used, we're also going to take advantage of that facility. And if I'm not mistaken, we're going to have our graduations happening out that facility too. So we don't have to go to the Seagull Center anymore. We can have those right in our own backyard. So we're excited about that piece. Next slide is going to show you a couple of things that's happening that we are absolutely excited about is Green City. If you're not familiar with Green City, we're talking about integrating extensive parks, trails, open green space. We'll include office space, retail space, housing units, hotels, and a sports arena that seats about 17,000 people. So that's going to be a big part of us bringing in activities, concerts, basketball games, volleyball matches, and hopefully we can um, attract some NCAA events here also to have at our, our facility. So that's going to be big. And on the right side, you'll see the sports splash that we're talking about building. That'll allow us to also be able to attract, attract some NCAA sports and have a practice facility. When they're not playing in that arena, they can go over here and practice and have that as a practice facility also. So we're excited about that. We're looking forward to that. That's going to be about 4,500 seats in the smaller complex that we'll be able to have some high school games, Richmond Times Dispatch we hopefully, hopefully have down there and some other things down at that place. The next slide I'm gonna mention, even though we have the bond referendum, we're gonna go ahead and mention it now because this is part of the bond. If you're not familiar with Deep Bottom Park, how many have been down there? Deep Bottom. Yeah, we need some improvements, right? So we're gonna invest some money into that. It's gonna be a $7 million investment improvements. We're looking to update the current structures, improve about 650 feet of the shoreline, um, take care of the boat ramp, <clears throat> and then create some small facilities for like events, small scale events and things like that and take advantage of historic interpretation areas. So that's gonna be on the bond. You might hear a little bit about it on, when Monica comes up, talk about the bond, but just to let you know, we covered this part. This will actually be your third question on the ballot. So make sure you pay attention to that for Deep Bottom Park. That's all we have. Any questions? Before we jump to the uh, bond referendum, there are a couple of things that I want to point out. Um, I want to go back. So I want to start here. First of all, I'm you know I'm thankful for um, our Parks and Rec team. Um, there's just, you know, they've been working hard in the midst of some transitions 
we lost a long serving parks and rec um, director resigned and um, went to another locality. We hired a new person that only lasted like two months. Yet the core of our team continues to stay and work hard. And we have so much stuff going on. And so um, people like Torrance and Julian, Kim, and whoever um, is called upon in, in our recreation and parks group, they, they always step up and we're thankful for them. Um, I had a, a, a dollar breakdown, um, but I left it in, in my office. So uh, I can't tell you the exact amount. Um, you know, one of the things that I, and I don't hear it as much anymore, it's, it's you know, one or two people who still say that, um, or maybe it's a couple of people who still say that we're being cheated in the East and there's not resources being put in in the East. It's not like it was when I first got here. Um, and, and it's an unfair, unfair assessment sometimes because, again, the district is over half of the county, while yet we only have 65 to 67,000 people on one half of the county. And the center and the west have the rest. And they're 340,000 um, approximately in Michael County citizens. So there is no way to possibly compare East of Henrico and West of Henrico. There are three or four times more people there than are in our district. Yet, you look at the dollars that have been spent in our district with the 2006 bond referendum, 16, and the 2022 proposed, 2016, most money per district was spent in our district. And when you add them up, both is still the most money spent in Verona district. And we had some really incredible things um, leading off with now the premier high school building, um, the Hallow Springs High School, which ended up costing over $110 million. But when you look at the things that we're doing in the park, in Dory Park, I personally feel like the best part in Henrico County is Dory. And Taylor, once is online, will compete. And so we'll have two of the best parks in our park system right here in the Verona district. Uh, the farmer's market, how many of you all do the farmer's market? All right, so quite a few people here um, go to the farmer's market. I don't need to tell you about how incredible the farmer's market is and what an asset it is to our district. Um, thank for the John and Cappy and their team for the concert series that they've been putting on this summer. Um, and again, this Sunday, this Saturday is the last concert for the summer. So if you've not caught the concert series on second Saturdays, you need to stop by. Um, Dory Park, cool things that are coming up, the spray park that'll be open um, right by the barn and our young people won't have to travel to um, to the East End Henrico Recreation Center anymore. They have their own spray park right here in Verona. In the park, we now have a state-of-the-art youth baseball stadium um, that has been played on this spring and this summer. If you've not had a chance to check it out, you need to go check it out. I mean, it's one of the top youth baseball stadiums um, on the East Coast. We've got some new trails. We have refreshed play equipment, and that's all in um, Dory Park. This Taylor Park project um, is a $19 million project that the voters approved back in 2016. The RFP will go out um, for a service at the end of October. And so once it goes out, we settle on um, who will um, actually do the physical work. The work itself is going to take a year and the physical work will begin um, early in 2023 um, with the uh, as aspired date of opening to be spring 2024, all right? And this park itself uh, is just a unique park. Uh, Dory Park has been a place where We've concentrated um, fields, baseball, and then general multi-purpose fields um, for all kinds of, you know, soccer, lacrosse, football, et cetera. This park is not going to be um, a field-led park. It's going to be a family-led park. And so up in the top left corner, the neighborhood activity area is connected to one of um, the neighborhoods. Uh, there and so there'll be hammocks and exercise areas and shelters and places for people to have community cookouts, et cetera. The natural base um, for the park 
is is wooded right now. And so we're going to try to preserve as much as that, much of that as we can. Um, and it's going to be an incredible place for um, nature trails. Um, uh, we're going to have boardwalks and discovery trails within the middle of the park. If you go up to the top right hand side of the park, we're going to have a memorial garden um, and a performance area. And um, in the memorial garden area, uh, we're going to be focused on uh, persons, service persons who have served in, in Rico County, who've lost their lives in service, and then recognizing um, those who've lost their lives serving our country in general. So that's going to be a focused area there. And then when you come down to the bottom right, um, that's what we're going to have, um, our pump track, which is a picture. Yep. So that's going to be a really cool place for people to ride their dirt bikes, et cetera. And then the skateboard, the skate park, not skateboard park, skate park, um, is going to be one of the premier ones in this region. And so, again, a really just cool place um, for you to take your family in East San Marco. And, I, you know, not to re be repetitive, um, you know, sometimes – you know, our job is to talk about the positive things in the midst of um, hearing a lot of questions about what we're not doing. There are things that we are doing, providing safe space for um, families. And we can talk about the Virginia Center of Commons project, uh, the Sports and Entertainment, and Entertainment um, Center. But again, that's going to help us to capture indoor sports. And we don't have to pay um, VCU significant amounts of money to have graduations anymore. We'll be able to have them. And this year, class of 23 will be the last group doing graduations at the Sequel Center. And so I'll, I'll let Monica and her crew talk about the bottom. I'm gonna turn it over now to Monica Smith Callahan, who is our deputy county manager for community fairs, really all things community uh, in, in Rico County, usually run through um, Monica's office. So she's gonna come up and um, they're gonna talk about the bond reference. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Um, as Mr. Nelson said, I am Monica Smith Callahan. I'm happy to serve as one of your deputy county managers here in the county. I brought a team of experts with me this evening to help present the bond referendum information to you. Um, as Mr. Uh, Reverend Nelson mentioned in, at the top of the meeting, voting started two Fridays ago, September 23rd, Early voting, early absentee voting will continue through November, Saturday, November 5th. We'll have two Saturdays where you can go vote. Um, and at Verina, you know that we have three, we'll have three satellite locations where you can early vote. Right now, you can go to the Eastern Government Center on Nine Mile Road or the Western Government Center on Parham Road. And starting on Monday, October 24th, our very own Verina, and I say our because I live in Verina District, born and raised, um, our Verina Library will serve as the third satellite location. So early voting, four questions on your ballot, and we are happy, I say we, my team who you'll meet in just a second, are happy to take you through each of those four questions that will be on your ballot. But first, let's level set. So what this is and what this isn't. So a bond, obviously, it's, a, it's a required by law that uh, municipalities, localities can issue bonds. It's an inexpensive, cheap form of debt to accrue. The same way in our personal lives, we look for cheap uh, uh, interest rates as we are looking to uh, purchase big things. This is the same. And we're going to bring up Dan Hayes in just a moment to give you more of that information. I always say I do people, not numbers. So we'll bring Dan up to do the numbers. Um, it's our opportunity connect with the community. I think today, this evening makes 152, 152 of these meetings that we have done over the past few weeks, being able to come out to Henrico residents and educate you on what the bond referendum is and the projects that are a part of the, a part of the bond referendum. Um, one of the only of 48 counties in the country that have triple A bond uh, ratings. Back to that low interest rate. Dan will touch on that when he speaks with you. High ratings, low interest rate. No impact to existing tax rate, which is very important for all of us, right? Uh, the 2016 bond referendum, 75% plus 
on all five questions. So we want to exceed that this year. So for the 2022 bond referendum, the goal is to have 100% voting on all four of our questions for 2022. So with that, I'd like to bring up Dan to talk numbers. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, Reverend Nelson. I appreciate the opportunity to come tonight. Um, my name is Dan Hayes, and I work in the Henrico County Budget Office as a supervisor. And if anybody has questions or would like to email me, my email address is hay069 at henrico.us. Um, the reason we can make the claim that we are not, well, more than a claim, but the statement that we're not going to raise your taxes as a result of this bond issue is that bond issues are not new for us. We've already made room in the budget to be able to pay for the future bonds that we need to do, to enter into in order to um, finance these very large projects, like some of the ones that we've been discussing tonight, and also some of the schools that we need to replace in order to keep our school system, you know, up to up to Henrico standards to keep it maintained well. We've got a list of all those projects in the pamphlet that we have. Yes, sir. Oh, you want a pamphlet? We'll we'll make sure to get you one. Um, and that outlines our whole plan for exactly how we're going to spend this money and exactly which projects are in, involved. And then we we will we will very carefully work to manage those projects so that they are really spent on the things that you authorize. But what this chart is trying to show you in in graphic form is the amount of debt that we've entered into from the past is represented in the blue. And as we move through time, we're paying that down. Now, if we didn't do anything, we wouldn't owe as much money in the future, but we also wouldn't be maintaining the future needs and uh, of the county. Now, entering into these municipal bonds or using bond funding in order to to finance these large projects is the only way that a count, you know, essentially the only way that a county has in order to, to buy a big project now and then ask current voters to only pay a portion of the expense of that. So that we, if we take something like, you know, Highland Springs High School, that high school is going to last for many years into the future. We've made this beautiful investment that's going to yield us dividends over time. It wouldn't really be equitable or fair or right to ask voters today to pay the whole thing off. We could try to run things that way, but it's really using municipal bonds is one way to say that in the next 10 and 20 years, voters will pay these bonds and, and it'll obligate them to pay these things so that current voters pay a piece of it as they use it, but then in the future, it'll get paid off and it'll become, you know, it'll run quite like the blue. So the, the green represents how we envision entering into additional debt that would keep it relatively level and well within what we plan to budget for the future so that we wouldn't have to raise taxes in order to maintain these important investments in our future to keep this oh, such a wonderful place to live and to work. Now, this chart doesn't talk really to payments, but you see how the, it, because we're talking about it as debt, it's like um, this graph really approximates, the numbers aren't quite right, but it kind of approximates that level amount that we'd be taking out of the budget each year in order to service the debt on this. Now, certainly we could take the step of not approving the bonds and then not entering into the green, but it would just be kicking the can down the road on maintaining this important infrastructure. You don't have to look very far to find communities that start doing that. And once they start, they can, you know, essentially they, they, they get such a large bill, they can never catch up. And we don't want to be in that position. So um, we're not going to raise taxes as a result of this. We're going to continue to meet our obligations to, to finance these, you know, future parks and recreations, fire projects, drainage and school important school projects we're going to continue to manage things the way that we have in the past in order to keep our triple triple a um, bond rating which means we get to borrow at a very low rate relative to other people and to keep paying on these bonds very affordable 
and worked into our budget that we already plan to maintain. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, yes, sir. That, that is a fantastic question. So inflation is certainly gonna interest in, impact borrowing rates, right? So if I think about that, like in the past, sorry, the question was, what is my opinion on the impact of inflation on these, you know, borrowing for these monies? And what I'd say there is that Henrico has the opportunity. We've got time on our side. Um, we need your permission, of course, and presuming that you approve entering into these bonds in, in the ballot, like Monica said, we're hoping 100% of everybody will vote to um, adopt the, the bonds. Um, if interest stayed high, if, sorry, if inflation stayed high, then the borrowing capacity or the borrowing rate would grow too, which is really what you're after. Um, if, for example, inflation went crazy and we were looking at very high interest rates, we would have the opportunity within the time frame that we're allowed on the bonds to hold off and to not enter into bonds. We're not, we're not obligated to run right out and, and borrow at this rate. This is a projection that we did. But if we found, for example, in 25 or 26, that the cost of borrowing was maybe double digits, we might hold off for a year until those rates came back our way. We don't have to be really in a hurry to enter into all this debt if the market isn't coming our way. It allows us to be very opportunistic. Similarly, and we've, we've got a good track record of this, when we find opportunities in the market to refinance our debt, we have the great credit rating and a lot of flexibility to be able to enter into that and to keep our borrowing as low as possible so that A, we can do more with what you give us authorization to do, and B, that we're really good stewards of, of of the money that we steward for you in the form of the county government. Does that make sense? Um, we're gonna get you guys to speak on the mic because there are persons who are watching online and can't hear you if they're watching online. Uh, th thank you, my real concern is the cost of construction versus the cost of borrowing. I think waiting to construct is gonna be much more harmful on our county infrastructure than the cost of borrowing because I see construction costs going up 10 and 15 percent gradually and sometimes in spurts. So to me, if we do as much construction as soon as we can, then we've got the luxury of having it and being able to get it before it costs three times as much to build it. Right. So, so if we're talking about, you know, um, timing those projects. We're certainly, we, we have the advantage in the county of having our, our ears to the ground and a lot of good input from projects that we have underway, working with the state and working with, you know, ongoing road projects to have, to have a sense. We also have a good relationship with builders. We, we can get insight into what things cost. You know, no one can predict perfectly future expenses and what inflation is gonna do to building costs. But, but the heart of what you're getting at is exactly the flexibility we're asking for, to be able to enter into these projects when we can do so opportunistically. If the, if the inflation is driving all costs up and it's a permanent increase to the base, there's no escaping the fact that we're gonna have to pay more for projects in the future. But if we have the opportunity in the future to take advantage of either building sooner or delaying a little bit, we, we have a record of already doing that. And, and we'll continue to do that. And there's another question back here. How you doing? I just really want to kind of piggyback off of what he said yes, based on something I heard you said. Kind of what I heard was stewardship. Yes. So you asking us to put you in a position to be stewards over this decision. So what's to hold you guys accountable that we give you that and then somebody doesn't do a good job? How, 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 what's the balance on that? Well, first we have to rely a little bit on our on our track record the type of work that we've done with our high, our recent high school construction. And then um, secondly, we everything we do is, is you know, open to the public, it's transparent. You can be part of, you know, we hold community meetings as we, as we work through these projects. You've got one of the best, I mean, 
Reverend Nelson is a fantastic way to keep abreast of what's going on. Coming to these kind of meetings is exactly what you want to do. So, so you know, our our work for you is an open book. So, you know, there the accountability is there, the track record's there. We're willing to, you know, show you what we've done and what we plan to do. That pamphlet that we handed out is a very extensive um, outline. And this this meeting, the fact that we've held 150 of these. There, you don't have to look far to find counties that aren't meeting with people. They're saying, if you want to see the information, go to the website. They're, they're putting all these ballot questions into one so that it's up or down, whether you support one piece of it or not. That's not the Henrico way. So, um, you know, I'm not just saying trust us. I'm saying, look at what we've done and, and prove whether or not we've been good stewards, or whether you can trust us to continue to do that. And if you don't like something we're doing, we want to hear from you because we really care that that you go to bed at night knowing that we're not running amok. All right, let's um let's try to move forward because there are other elements to the. But don't go anywhere. I have one more question. One more question for you. Um, there was a question online about, uh, and this uh, this comes up often. Um, in Michael County, I, I think dropped the. Um, the tax rate like seven times, I think I might be wrong, but um, we were at 87, we dropped it to 85 last year. But the question is, um, you you dropped the tax rate, but you raised the property values. Can you speak to that at all? Um, some, a question came on, a, a question online was, will you raise the property values? Right, so the state law requires us to be at 100% valuation. We do our very best every year to update that. And we are, um, to my knowledge, the only community in the in the Commonwealth that you know had a hundred had a dollar three valuation forty years ago and has a lower valuation now. So and and by the way, I live in the county too, and I'm interested in in you know some accountability in this space too. And it's true that property values have gone up, but it's convenient to not maybe index that for inflation, you know, because that that impacts things too. It is true that we in Henrico County have taken advantage over time of the fact that valuations have gone up to allow us to stay, you know, without increasing that rate. In fact, as Reverend Nelson pointed up, out, not only have we reduced the taxes many times over the last 40 years, we've rebated money, which is something that no other locality in the Commonwealth ever tried to do. Um, and we've done that. We're showing that that um, we do our best with our projections, but if we collect more money than what we feel it's appropriate to hold on to, we will, we're not above giving it back. Um, and that's part of why we're saying we're not gonna raise taxes. Now, there are communities out there that have valuations go up and they raise the taxes, which I consider to be a double whammy. And I, am, I also have to keep in mind that the tax rate's gone down my valuation went up. I did pay more, but I look at all the wonderful services that I have. I live, I've lived in communities where I've gotten almost nothing. My taxes were twice what I'm paying here. And um, I've got fantastic roads. I've got awesome services. I've got fantastic parks and recreation, a great education system. And I'm paying half for a home value, the same exact value as my friends are still paying, you know, a, a few hundred miles north of here. So it is true. We have seen value valuations go up and you've paid more in taxes. We acknowledge that, but we're not double whamming you with increasing your property rate at the same time that your property value has gone up. We're trying to live within the growth that is organic. That's that's really spreading around the value and making your property more valuable. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. That was Really good explanations. Um, I would like to, oh, well, first let's look at the proportion of the projects. As you can see here with the bond, over $500 million worth of projects and how that is disseminated or proposed to be disseminated, schools, recreation and parks, public safety and drainage. And I'd like to welcome up our chief of staff for Henrico County Public Schools, Ms. Holly Coy. Thank you, Monica, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Holly Coy, and I serve as the Chief of Staff for Henrico County's Public Schools, and I'm thrilled to be here with you this evening 
to talk about the exciting school projects that are on the referendum this year. So there are a total of eight projects related to our public schools. Uh, the first five you'll see here on the screen, uh, these are significant renovations or complete rebuilds. Um, so you can see, I don't know if you can read the years there, but all of these schools are more than 50 years old um, and are in need um, of updates in order to provide the world-class education um, that we believe that our students, all of our students deserve. Um, so Johnson, which is the top left there, would be a significant renovation, um, but, but within some of the existing infrastructure. All of the other schools that you'll see here, Davis Elementary School, Highland Springs Elementary School, Longan Elementary School, and Keokasin Middle, um, they will, uh, on these sites, build new while students are in the existing buildings. They will move students, uh, and then they will scrape the old schools off. So entirely new buildings for those four. In addition to that, the bond referendum would provide the county the opportunity to build two new elementary schools in corridors where we're seeing a lot of growth. Uh, so these are small renderings, but in the top right corner um, is a new Fairfield Elementary School. This is in the River Mill community. The, the county already owns the land. Um, and uh, this is one of the area where areas where we have seen and expect additional growth of families in the county. The bottom rendering uh, is for a new elementary school in the Brooklyn district. Uh, we know that in that district in particular, we have seen a lot of growth um, as a, you know, in relation to the rest of the county uh, over the last decade. And so we are still looking for a site for that school. We don't yet know exactly where that will go. Uh, this would be one of the last projects on the, the list for schools. And then last, but perhaps most exciting, uh, is a living classroom at Wilton Farm. Uh, and this is a project that we are really excited about because we will lead the nation with this particular project. Um, the county has a piece of property down along the river at Wilton Farm. Um, and we, with your permission from the bond referendum, will build a living classroom that will serve students K-12 throughout the entire district. Um, and this building will uh, be off the grid, essentially. It will provide more energy back to the grid than it consumes. There are no K-12 public schools like this anywhere in the country. There are higher ed buildings uh, that our, our teams went and saw as they were thinking about what this could be, uh, but we would really lead the nation. And so that is really exciting to us. Um, this is part of a longer and bigger vision uh, to provide students with environmental science education that is world-class and relevant to the world in which they will work and live. Uh, so at Verina High School, this year we've opened the doors to a new environmental science specialty center uh, and ultimately hope that this building will able, be able to serve both that spe specialty center, uh, but as I mentioned, students K-12 throughout the entire district to get that hands-on experience in their learning. So those are the school projects. Happy to answer questions if you have them. I'll also note, I left some of my cards on the table on your way out, my email's on there. So if you think of anything else, please let us know. We'll be happy to answer. Thanks. Next, I'd like to introduce Deputy Chief uh, Tom LaBelle to talk about our public safety project. Good evening, everybody. One of the things I like to think about as I look at these buildings is that <laughs> The number of years from 1918 to 1970 is the same number of years from 1970 to 2022. Um, and, and that's hard to think about uh, sometimes, but a lot of these stations have existed for a long time. Some of you may recognize uh, Station 6 uh, by White Oak uh, Village Shopping. Uh, you can see up top where the, uh, the truck company, the big yellow truck and the engine uh, and also a medic unit have to come in and out of there. And our crews live underneath the, the apparatus bay, which means they have to run upstairs. Uh, when this was originally built, it was built for two units. We now stage three units in there. 
Uh, and so we're running out of space. We've already run out of space uh, to the left. Um, and so that would stay in that general area and move over to uh, closer to Miller. Uh, so it would uh, still be able to support the same area. Firehouse one, which is over uh, on Azalea near the racetrack. Uh, quite frankly, the roof is leaking. We're running out of space. Uh, and when those stations, actually all these stations were built, uh, firemen, we're all firemen. Uh, we're firefighters now, and we try to have very inclusive workspace. Uh, these stations really weren't built with that in mind. Uh, so station one, uh, if the bond were approved, we'd go out, find land, and move forward with that. Uh, Firehouse 11 uh, <clears throat> is um, also ready for rebuild. It's on a really small piece of property. Again, uh, it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, um, but the apparatus is in the middle. Uh, the living space is on the sort of the left-hand side, and the kitchen is on the other side. Uh, I can tell you when the apparatus backs in, uh, whatever you're eating uh, tastes like diesel. Um, and so it's it's not great. Uh, and so we're, we're hoping to be able to do that. And then finally, what I call our teenage stations, uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17, uh, which are all on the west side of the county, need refurbishment. Uh, they don't need to be rebuilt, but they do need refurbishment on the inside. Uh, and so those are the uh, those are the pieces there. Uh, I, I would also like to point out that uh, under the last bond, we're building a station 23 on the east end, which affects sort of the east end and how we're able to move things around. So as these stations get moved, uh, we map out future calls. We think about the best location. The next is uh, two pieces um, that we're really excited about both. Uh, the one is a public safety training center. Um, when our current public uh, training center over on Woodman Road was created, the type of construction we saw in the county was basically sort of a standard apartment, standard single family home. Uh, you don't need to drive too far to see that that's not what we're seeing all the time. We would maintain that original training center, but what we'd also build is a streetscape that recognizes two important things. One, the expansion of apartment complexes within our community as a whole, but also the existence of commercial retail underneath apartments. Um, that's unique uh, in this day and age. It's pretty common back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And so what that means is there are apartments above the pizza oven, uh, and that can be somewhat problematic. And so learning how to deal with those uh, and being able to work in a true life environment uh, not only for the uh, fire department, but also for the police department. Uh, gives them some space to train in as well. Uh, and then finally, um, an animal shelter, but also an adoption sh shelter. Uh, right now, we're not really able to facilitate uh, getting uh, animals uh, that uh, our animal control officers collect uh, into loving homes. Uh, and that's a pretty logical next step for the process. And so that's what this property would be able to do. Pretty picture of the dog. Any questions on uh, on the public safety pieces? Yes, sir. Uh, I, we need to get you a mic. Thank you. Would you consider a design, build, construction on any of those projects? Yeah, yeah absolutely. We we've done that now. We also have inside uh, in house uh, our own engineer. Um, uh, who helps us throughout these processes, not just with buildings, but also with apparatus purchase uh, to make sure that we're, we're flowing through the same uh, process. What I'd also say is there are a limited number of folks that build fire stations, and there are a limited number of folks that engineer, build, do, do the entire package. And so that tends to be the way we go. Now, my, my suggestion is that the design build process in the next couple of years is going to be very popular with, I think, some of the commercial work slowing down. Yeah, I, I would agree that you, I think you had brought up before the, the cost of construction. And as we start to see that go down again, we've got some contractors that we've had a lot of luck with in the past. Um, they've been good to us. The biggest problem we've run into, which everyone has uh, in the last two years, is supply chain. Uh, more than anything else. Any other questions on public safety? Yes, sir. 
Yes, I was wondering, could you speak to, uh, have there been any problems with uh, fire because of the training center they have now not accurately reflecting these kind of uh, uh, residential over commercial? So I don't, I don't know that I could point to uh, uh, problems per se. What I can point to is if I have a choice for our firefighters to figure out how to most efficiently address a fire, I would just assume they did it at the training center and not at your fire. Uh, it's, it's just not an effective way. Uh, and so the more we're able to do it, the other really interesting thing on the training center that we're looking to build is the ability to move walls around. Uh, right now, the building we have is a concrete building. And once you've done training in it three times, you know, you go up the stairs and to the right and there's two doors on the left and there's two, unless you have a really vivid imagination, it's a little difficult to, to get really great training out of it. And this will allow us to, to help folks that maybe don't have as vivid imagination. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I am just curious about um, with this training center. So uh, I've seen in some literature that's gone out that there's not another training center like this within something like 100 miles or something. I was wondering if this is typical to have in a metropolitan area like you have in Greater Richmond and Henrico. So it, it's typical of larger county systems, uh, which we are. We weren't 25 years ago. We are today. So 100 miles away. So when you go up into Maryland, uh, Northern Virginia uh, has one similar to this, uh, are all sort of heading in this general direction. This was a question that um, once we build this new facility, is there any thought as to where we um, allow training for other departments, not just in Virginia, to where, you know, as a new facility, would it may draw interest from other uh, fire agencies? Yeah, we actually do that now um, because we have we have. Uh, a good training facility uh, last year, uh, which is two years ago, I'm sorry, uh, which is one of the things that got us really thinking about this is Hanover's uh, training center got decommissioned. And so like that, they didn't have a training center. Uh, and so we don't obviously want to wait for that, but they come over, Goochland will come over. We do some high angle uh, training. We have an annual technical rescue training program where folks from uh, quite frankly, all over the United States come to Enrico County uh, and the region to do uh, training. So, yeah, we're very open to that. And and actually do some, just really quickly, do some uh, agreed upon, some shared resources. So if you're coming to our training center, uh, maybe you bring the saws and the blades, right? And so we it, it, it's sort of shared amongst the groups. Thank you. Tom? And one thing Tom didn't mention, and I think is important to mention, is the fact that Henrico County still provides free EMS services. So our fire and EMS are together. So as he's talking about apparatuses, uh, we are one of few that when you dial 911, you do not get a bill. And that is really major for, for those of us, I know in my family, aging, aging family members, it's important that they have the ability to dial 911 and not have to worry about receiving a bill afterwards. So just wanted to add that in. Uh, really quickly, you already heard from Torrance and team about Deep Bottom Park. Uh, in addition to uh, two other parks you'll see in the pamphlet that talk about um, additional additions or improvements to two other parks in the county. And lastly, as a part of this bond, this is only the second time in history that we have ha asked our residents uh, to approve an allocation of bond funding to go towards drainage projects. Uh, this is another equal opportunity offender here in our county, our drainage and flooding issues. And so um, that is literally someone's backyard. Um, we know that it, it is a problem in the county and the allocation um, would go towards those higher or highest priority drainage um, uh, issues in the county. Uh, last slide, as you can see here, again, 
equitable distribution of projects throughout all five magisterial districts. Mr. Reverend Nelson alluded to the fact that we are the Verina district um, having several of these projects. As you saw, a new school uh, with our living um, building learning uh, through our environmental science program, uh, Deep Bottom Park for recreation, the new um, uh, fire station that would move over to Gay and Miller uh, across from uh, uh, the replacing the one on Laburnum now, and then uh, Holland Springs Elementary. Yes, sir. Oh, we need a mic. <laughs> Project. So that, I really be honest. I kind of came with something I wanted to bring your attention. I'm I'm in support of what you're doing, but I have a concern. I live not far from here, and this road work that's been going on has destroyed our streets. Okay. It's tearing up my car, and I don't I don't get that because when I go other places, and I'm not trying to say anything but this. When I go other places, I don't have that problem. I go to work every day, and I'm I'm ducking holes, man, and sometimes I miss them, and it's damage to my car. And I don't understand why we can't just have that road paved. I mean, we, we got this great stewardship, mm. this great money. We're doing a great job financially, and I'm not, not, not the person that you, sir, but it don't make sense to me why they can't be paid. I'm, I'm, my neighborhood has patches, which affects my property value. If I'm trying to sell my house. And somebody comes in the neighborhood, they see these patches, they might look down on the neighborhood. What's, what's the neighborhood? Dobby Town Meadows. Okay. I was going to say, I, I think you came in a little bit. Yeah, later, I was there. I do apologize. Yeah, so we, 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 brought, we brought the big guns. We brought our director of public works here. And after the chief, you will, you will hear. You'll hear about our road. And Terrell, please, sir, find this guy. And he's... He, Give him the specific streets, okay. and he'll tell you. Y'all will work it out, but it'll it'll get taken care of. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right, and just if you have any questions regarding the bond referendum, and we have a whole website dedicated to it. It's on your pamphlet that you got when you came in, and any of us can be found during or after the meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, information again for Rhino residents, particularly for those of you who are watching online, uh, you know, before the chief comes up, a couple of things that I wanted to highlight. Um, and, and I get the questions all the time. And I said this at the beginning, our district is huge. Unfortunately, you could be in the Verona district, live in Highland Springs and feel like if you're in Elko or you're in um, this part of Verona, that you're not being served by county dollars in your district because our district is so big. I, and I wish I had the map to show you there are parts of, there are other districts that are only a part of our district. And so Tuckahoe, Three Chop has a lot of people. And because they have so many people, the land mass is, is small. So when things happen there, you can see it. You can be in our part of the community, you can be in Verona and never travel to another part of the community and it will make you feel like nothing's happening because you don't see it on an everyday basis. So when uh, it's almost like the Verona High School and Highland Springs High Schools are, um, you know, cowboys and the commanders, you know, football, um, you know, just the communities just don't like each other when it comes to sports, et cetera. So if you say you're doing something in Highland Springs, automatically the Verona, you know, Verona folk, or you say something happened in Verona, Highland Springs, but just know for the good of the community, the dollars are um, flowing into your part of the community. And so Verona High School back in 2014 and 15 had a $40 million um, renovation. And so we just started the rebuilding about two years ago. Um, the outdoor schools we are looking at and on every bond referendum project after this one, we're gonna be looking at ways to um, do away with outdoor campuses. And so Verona High School is going to get the attention um, that it needs again before um, not too long. But I just wanted to share that we did spend um, close to $40 million on Verona High School not too long ago. All right. Um, $511 million um, 
investment into the county. Now, I, I see um, uh, comments about um, not raising our taxes. Every year, the question comes: whether if you even if you decrease the property value, you still increase in my assessment. So it's like you're raising my taxes. That is an annual question as it relates to um, assessing property tax. And so even though we have a bond referendum this year, that is not about bond referendum. That is an every year thing. And you already had heard the answer earlier. I, I hope that you were not, I hope that you wouldn't vote against this, um, you know, over that, uh, over that issue, but you, you know, you had a right, we'll see where it goes. You know, six years ago, overwhelmingly there was support for this. I think that we're great stewards. You ride around our county. Are we perfect? No. Are there some things that we need to work on? Yes. Um, but I think that we are incredible stewards of what we do. And so out of this bond referendum, we're going to get a rebuild for Highland Springs Elementary School, school built in 1966. Again, Monica and her team brought up the living classroom on Wilton Farm, which we did purpose, which, which we did per, purchase not too long ago. That is a major investment that we're putting um, on that property for this environmental science education slash specialty center program that I think is going to be groundbreaking for us um, in Henrico and more so in Eastern Henrico. Deep Bottom Park um, is there, Firehouse 6 is there, um, there's another firehouse that is about to be uh, breaking ground soon at Westover and Nine Mile Road. It comes from the 16 barn referendum. And then finally, the public safety training system and animal shelter adoption center are on Kane Road, Kane Road in the western part of the county. But the, both projects serve the whole uh, county. So the public safety building trains fire safety personnel across Henrico County. And so though the building is there, it benefits the entire camp, um, county as well as the animal shelter. So this is not about east-west when it comes to the animal shelter. This no-kill um, shelter is really about um, keeping animals alive. And there are many people who are looking for pets now, et cetera, um, and we were not able to provide homes and so now this shelter, this adoption center is going to find some homes for um, lots of animals and hopefully they'll bring love and joy to people across this county. All right, Chief, um, we're going to bring up our Chief of Police who has been, Chief, has it been two years yet? Hadn't it? it has been two years? All right. So it seems like the life of a police chief is like dog years. So it's like seven years for everyone. Um, and so Chief English has been working hard, been with us. So I'm going to turn it over to the Chief. All right, thanks, thanks, Mr. Nelson, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, before I get started, just to kind of give you an idea of kind of what's going on in the county as it pertains to crime and what's going on in particularly the Verada uh, district. I uh, just want to put a plug in. Uh, Deputy Chief LaBelle talked about the Public Safety Training Center. And while you can ever uh, predict what, what situation you're going to run into in public safety, I will say that a training facility that's up to date it, the more training you can do as realistic as you can uh, is going to be beneficial for everyone uh, because you don't want your public safety officials going into something that looks looks totally foreign to them. And a lot of times you're going to do that's going to happen because, like I said, you can't predict anything that's going to happen in terms of public safety. But there are situations we run into where we can do the most realistic training as we can uh, before we put our folks out there. And so a facility like that is up to date, standard state of the art type of facility is going to really be beneficial for everyone. So I will just put that plug in for it. So as it pertains to crime in the county, uh, a little bit, a little bit different numbers uh, than what even what I talked about last week uh, in, in this meeting. So last week I, I reported that you know countywide we were up two percent in violent crime. Well, this week we're down two percent in violent crime compared to last year. Um, so I'll just knock on wood. You know the things are trending in the right direction. Uh, particularly in Verona district last week, I, you know, I, I reported that we've had eight homicides in, in Verona. Uh, we've uh, last week I reported we had nine homicides in Verona. We were actually, we have eight. Uh, one of them came off the books because it was justifiable shooting. Uh, and so when you have those, it, it really, it, it stays on the books as a homicide, but it doesn't really count towards the number, so to speak. So I, 
I just want people to know that I'm not playing with numbers. Uh, we've had we've had eight homicides this year in, in Verona compared to five we had at the same time last year. Uh, out of those eight, six of those have been closed. Uh, so we're still working on two of those, trying to solve those two homicides. What we have seen, even across the county, and particularly in Verona, is we've seen an uptick in, in, in gun violence, especially with our young people. Uh, and it's not so much the uptick in gun violence itself, it's the number of rounds that we're seeing fired uh, in, at, at individuals, at, at residents, and things of that nature. Uh, I can tell you that when we have homicides, it's very rare that there is a homicide that is a, uh, it's not targeted towards an individual or individuals. It's very rare you have a, a so-called innocent individual that, that somebody's j just randomly shooting uh, and, and gets struck. Um, most of the homicides, the individual was an intended target for whoever the suspect may have been. So I just want to make sure everybody keeps that in mind. Um, when I talk about violent crime, I'm talking about homicides. I'm talking about aggravated assaults. I'm talking about robberies. I'm talking about rapes. And I tell you, in in in, uh, in Verona right now, you're up nine percent in violent crime. Um, and it did, again, it's very small numbers. You know, your robberies are up three from last year. Uh, your rapes up one from last year. Like I said, we we're we we're eight to five last year in homicides here in Verona. Uh, so you are seeing the numbers, uh, we are seeing those numbers slowly come back down. Uh, the biggest increase we're seeing, even countywide, um, is, in, is in our property crimes. And so when we talk about property crimes, we're talking about larcenies, we're talking about auto thefts, uh, and we're talking about burglaries. Uh, in Verona, what we've seen a huge increase so far this year is burglaries. We've seen a lot of break-ins to, to, to piece of people's residence, uh, stores, and things of that nature over, over, the, over this past year. Uh, and we've always seen a lot of larcenies. Uh, a lot of those larcenies are pertaining to larcenies from automobiles. Again, we have a lot of individuals that still leave their cars unlocked. Uh, you have opportunists that will go around and check door handles and stealing things out of folks' car. And the other big larceny pieces, catalytic converter thefts, that we're seeing, seeing a lot of that. Uh, it's a nationwide trend, and we're seeing a lot of that also in, in Verona. And so one of the things we just ask people to be very vigilant, uh, especially when it comes to catalytic converter thefts, as you know, uh, there has to be a sound that's made. Uh, a lot of times these folks are getting under cars and you hear a saw. And we're asking people, it's because you hear a saw and construction may be going on. We're asking people to be very vigilant of that because it doesn't take long for them to get under your car, two or three minutes and they're gone. Uh, and so we're asking people to really work on that. One of the things we are doing, and uh, this is a region-wide effort, uh, Henrico, Richmond, Chesterfield, Hanover, we're all working on a project with, uh, with Midas. Uh, to try to color and stencil uh, catalytic converters. Uh, because right now, uh, if somebody takes a catalytic converter off your car, it's very hard for us to track where the catalytic converter came from. Uh, and that's very difficult. You're seeing these individuals go to scrap yards, uh, and it's not illegal. You know, we've seen people that have 15 catalytic converters in their car. There's nothing illegal about that, but it does make you suspicious why, why somebody would have 15 catalytic converters. Uh, and again, it's nothing illegal for them to go into the scrap yard to, do, to turn those in and trade them for money. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is make it more difficult for individuals. And so we're working on a project right now with Midas to see if we can come up with some type of plan uh, to give us some more teeth when we come across these and make sure it makes it more difficult for those that, that choose to go that route. So those are some of the things we're seeing right now in the county trend-wise as far as crime is concerned. Uh, and then, you know, we have pockets of, of we have pockets of areas within within Verona that we're really focusing on, especially trying to curtail the, the violent crime that we're seeing uh, occur across the county. So those are some of the projects we're working on. Um, uh, and then I will just I would just add that we're seeing an increase over since COVID has, has occurred. Uh, we've seen an increase in uh, traffic fatalities across the county and, and even Verona as well. A lot of pedestrians are getting struck by vehicles. Uh, and for whatever reason, you know, we're seeing the, the driving behaviors of individuals have, have drastically changed over the last two years in terms of how people are driving. So we're trying to work on some things uh, along with Terrell Hughes's shop uh, to make sure that we're doing all that we can to make our roadway safe as well. So those are some of the things we're seeing right now as, as it pertains to, uh, to, to crime. So any questions anybody may have? Question online. Do you, are there any questions in the audience? I think the same question was asked to you on Monday um, by the same person, but um, again, why is the threshold for fraud set at $5,000 up from $1,000, according to your sergeant? I don't know what sergeant it is. For credit card fraud before it is investigated. Why is the threshold for fraud set at 5000 
up from 1,000 for credit card fraud. So, uh, Mr. Nelson, I'll be honest with you, that question uh, I got with that individual at the last meeting, uh, and I know my folks have reached out to that individual personally. Uh, so, uh, I know we're working on that particular situation that the person is dealing with. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, a lot of a lot of things that have taken place in terms of legislation has changed. And then there's a lot of things that have taken place in terms of prosecution that have changed. Uh, so, you know, when you got efforts putting in or uh, trying to solve a crime uh, that you're going to get them, and I, I, I hate to use the term, but for lack of a better term, minimal return in terms of prosecution, uh, that that that's why you see some of the thresholds have changed, just like you've seen thresholds change for, for grand larceny in legislation. Those thresholds have changed, you know, grand larceny now is a thousand dollars. If it meets a thousand dollars, you get, you can get charged with a felony rather than, whereas before it was minimal, you know, you had a $200 threshold for, for grand larceny. Uh, so those things have, have, have really diminished. And so when you get, when individuals get prosecuted, a lot of times, you know, there's not what we, what some people consider a lot of, a recourse or, or, or a lot of punishment, so to speak, for those type of crimes. And so that's why you've seen some of those things go up uh, in terms of the threshold. And again, it's not like we're going to, we're not, it's not like we're going, not going to investigate it. We are. Uh, so I just, I just wonder, I don't want anybody to say, you know, we're not going to look at, look into it at all just because it doesn't meet a certain threshold. A lot of questions, y'all. I'm sorry. Uh, officer, I, our chief, I'd like to ask you um, this question, where it's kind of twofold. Um, how do you see mental illness affecting our crime rates? And what steps can the police department take that might help with that? Like, say, you know, you have young adults who have mental challenges. The family can see it, right? can witness it, but they are powerless to take action because they can't make them do anything. Is it anything being worked on? Can anything be worked on where if I, as a parent, say to the police officer, you know, my daughter has challenges and they need help because they're going to probably continue that behavior to, but, but right now the way the system is, to my understanding, is that, and I've been told this by a counselor before, that something tragic happens and then the result. What I'm saying, are we, do we have any proactive things? Do you understand what I'm saying, yes, right? Sir. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a really, really great question. Uh, and I would say from a crime standpoint, I don't see mental illness as really affecting crime, so to speak. Uh, I would say crime is more affected by substance abuse more than mental illness. But the piece you talk about is vitally important in the county because our, our folks get tied up tremendously on mental illness issues. And I understand exactly what you're, what you're dealing with because we see it so often. Uh, one of the things I will say that we have here in Arrakow County, and again, this is my, my third agency I've, I've been a part of, uh, is we have a very, very robust crisis intervention team uh, that really, really does a great job of checking on those, those people that have to use uh, use those services as it, as it pertains to mental illness. And so what we do is a lot of times you have those individuals that you talk about that can, that consistently uh, a parent or a loved one may call about their loved one uh, and they may be on medication. They may have gotten a lot of treatment, but it's still, it's still recurring. And a lot of times what we do is we have individuals that will go out and make sure they check on those individuals outside of when you call. We go out and we actually check on those individuals to make sure they're taking medication. Are there any other resources they may need? Those are the follow-ups we do outside of just getting a call for that. And I can tell you that across the state, legislation is looking at some other opportunities and ways for us to partner with our mental health partners in order to make those, uh, those responses even more favorable for those families. Because again, a lot of times when you got mental health, and I, and I, I continuously say this, if you're dealing with a mental health issue, I'm not sure if you want to see me. I, I, again, I'm not saying that there are not times you won't need to see the police, but I'm not sure if I'm going through a mental health episode that I am the face that, that, that needs to be seen. Now, there are times that I do because, again, because the situation may be so dangerous, 
but that there are other times that I feel like there are some there's some opportunities for us to look at other avenues and us kind of coming in the background, so to speak. And so we're looking at those those opportunities to do that. And again, uh, I will tell you that we really do spend a lot of time on mental health costs throughout throughout the county. So great, great question. Any any yes. Um, yeah, I wondered um, of the eight or nine homicides you mentioned, how many of those might have been related to intimate partner violence? And I also know that um, someone from the attorney general's office had a, a conversation with Beth Bonnewell about implementing the version of the lethality assessment protocol that the attorney general's uh, office uses, which is slightly different from what we're currently using. And I wondered if there's any progress toward that. So a great, great question. Uh, so without without having the numbers in front of me, uh, I do know at least two of those uh, dealt with a dealt with a domestic type situation. Uh, I will tell you the lethality assessment tool is a is a very viable resource for us. Uh, I can tell you that I've I've used that in the prior two agencies that I've been a part of, and that has been brought to our attention. It was something that we are definitely looking at. Uh, I do think it provides us some other opportunities to provide some more resources, ask more questions and provide a more safe haven for those individuals that are dealing with domestic issues. So again, it is something we're definitely looking at and Beth does a great job uh, with us to uh, make sure we're, we're traveling down the right path. All right, any other questions for the chief? You were talking about earlier about the catalytic converter problem. And I don't know if things have changed, but I know years ago, if a person were to go to a scrapyard with a large amount of copper, they had to have some documentation as to where they were getting this from. Now, do these scrapyards, is, uh, do they have any kind of responsibility on their end to make sure that what they're receiving is legitimate? So the great, great, another great question. So the things you ask are the things we have discussions of in terms of how can we hold those entities more accountable as well. And right now there is nothing that says, you know, they have to report, you know, if somebody brings in 10 catalytic converter thefts, that's nothing that says, well, I need to report that to the police. That is the reason that we're looking at Midas and partnering with them because now at least if we are stenciling and painting catalytic converters, now they know, okay, that must have been taken off somebody's vehicle and it may be illegal. So it gives them another avenue that maybe they need to contact us. Right now, there is nothing on the books that re requires them to do that. And so those are some avenues and gaps that we're trying to close. So great, the great, great question, because that's, that's the problems we're running into. All right, any more? All right, great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, we appreciate you. As you are coming down, our planning director, Mr. Joe Emerson, is coming up. Uh, and I won't walk up. I'll let him take the show. Um, and this is a revised, well, not a revised, there's a lot going on with projects coming into the pipeline, in the pipeline, already moving. Um, and so this is probably a town hall in itself, and he's going to try to do it in 10 minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Reverend Nelson. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you tonight. I'm Joe Emerson. I'm the director of planning with the county. And Reverend Nelson has asked me to try to walk through a few of the developments that are going on in Verina. I've tried to touch on the ones I think you'd be most interested in. There's quite a bit of activity out here, and it's more than we could talk about, honestly, in, in one meeting. But I've broken them down into, into several different categories, and we're going to start out with what we call the active and pending plans of development and subdivisions. These are entitled projects. They've already been through the legislative process. They've been approved, and now they're in the technical review phase and or under construction. We're going to start out with those projects that are under review. Uh, two that you've heard a little bit about tonight. Uh, one is the Taylor Farm Park Master Plan. That's on. That's being developed by uh, our Reckon Parks Division. It's on my side of the house right now for review. It is located on Whiteside Road across from uh, Chickahominy YMCA. You've heard a lot about that, so I won't say any more. Uh, Henrico Firehouse 23 is also under review. Uh, you did hear mention of that from uh, Chief LaBelle. It's a 13,409 square foot firehouse with related facilities. 
It is located at the intersection of Nine Mile Road and Westover Avenue. This is what we call gateway landmark, and I'm gonna mention this again in just a second and, get in, and tie this together for you. This is just a portion of it that has been added to a larger overall project. But this is what we call gateway landmarks. It is an extension of the landmark project that's located to the rest, west of this, which is under construction. This is located at the Williamsburg and Dry Bridge uh, Commons intersection. It's east of Old Memorial Drive, west of 295. This is section one of the gateway at Landmark, which again is the portion that uh, is adjacent to 295. It's 72 condominiums and 13 single family residential homes, a uh, total of 85 total units under review. The next project is Parkside Towns that is being developed by H.H. Hunt. This is on uh, the intersection of East Williamsburg Road and Whiteside. It's behind the Chickahominy YMCA. 123 townhouse units on 26 acres. And again, it is under review. This is the Wood Spring Suites Extended Stay Hotel. It's going to be located at 4615 Williamsburg Road. I refer to it as uh, adjacent to the old Bill Talley uh, Ford deal dealership. It really is adjacent to the CVS and the uh, Lidl. Uh, that's what, what is there now at the intersection of Williamsburg and Laburnum. Orient you a little bit better. It is a by right subdivision or by right development. The zoning was in place. It's a four story, 122 room extended stay hotel and associated infrastructure. And it actually just moved through the review process and should be entering construction plan phase soon. Uh, this is Foster's Reach, better known as the Lily Pad. It's uh, located at, at Osborne Turnpike, north of its intersection with Kingsland Road. There was an existing marina there, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, it had grown, it had come under new ownership, it had grown. Uh, they were having a lot of activities in expanding the marina. Uh, they were expanding past what the original approvals had allowed. So they came in to the board, received a provisional use permit to allow the marina accessory uses and some event space, including a restaurant with outdoor seating. And their site plan is currently under review and, uh, and they're working to get all their expansion in the proper uh, format for approval. Rockets Landing continues to grow. We have several sections of Rockets Landing that have potential activity and activity underway. We've got what we refer to as blocks 17 and 19. Those are commercial entities. Uh, we've got a one story, 9,500 square foot restaurant building with outdoor dining areas approved and a two story, 25,000 square foot office building. Those are in blocks 17 and 19. And block 24, section 11, there are 24 townhouse units, averaging 2,400 square feet with two car garages. Those are also under review at this time. So Rockets Landing uh, continues to grow. It soon will, uh, will be built out, but it's still got some area yet to develop into. Now, these are plans that are approved and are actually under construction. I mentioned to you when we spoke about the gateway at Landmark that I would tie that together for you. What you see currently under development is really the phase one of Landmark. Again, it's at Williamsburg Road and Dry Bridge Commons Road. Uh, it's 358 total lots, 34 single family and 322 townhouse lots. When combined with the gateway at Landmark project, that's 443 residential units. Uh, you do also have with this a B2C corner down at the corner of Williamsburg and Dry Bridge. And that is currently, we've got a uh, plan of development submitted for a Wawa on that corner, 6,000 square foot facility, and it is moving through the review process now. There is earth moving on this site. 
To the left side of this slide, you'll see Castleton, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We currently have three new sections in on Castleton, sections five, six, and seven. That's 244 more single family units. The total units for Castleton in, in total is 575. Also, you have on this slide the Bickerstaff Crossing Apartments. There is a temporary occupancy permit already issued for this project. It's located on the south line of Bickerstaff Road. Again, this was existing zoning that had been there for an extended period of time. Uh, what you have going on here is a three-story, approximately 80,000 square foot multifamily apartment building with 60 dwelling units. This is Fulton Yard, which is across from Rockets Landing. Uh, it's located on 37th Street and Gooden Street. It, these are multifamily dwelling units, uh, approximately 60 units. There are two other buildings that are in the city. The city line splits this property. Uh, and that's not part of the plan in the county, but is part of the total plan there, which will make up uh, 216 units. The building in the county is a five-story building, includes 7,408 square feet of amenity leasing office space. The other two buildings are two five-story buildings. Those are the city portion of the overall project. These are currently under building permit review. You've got a new bank coming to Verina. Uh, it's the Chase Bank at 4508 Laburnum Avenue. There were two existing office buildings at this site that I believe are demolished at this point. Uh, underway is the construction of a 3,280 square foot bank with a dedicated drive through an ATM. This is South Laburnum Avenue and Jan Road. The Sauer Industrial Center, which I'm sure all of you have noticed on Laburnum Avenue. We've got two buildings under construction there at this point. This is located at South Airport Drive and Pocahontas Parkway. We've got a one-story, 560,000 square foot warehouse distribution building and a one-story, 279,000 square foot warehouse distribution building and associated infrastructure under construction. Now we're moving into legislative actions. These are recent active and pending rezoning cases, and I'm going to lead out with zoning cases that have been recently approved. The first one that I will uh, will go over with you quickly is Better Housing Coalition. This is behind uh, Carter Woods. It's near the Eastern Government Center at uh, the intersection of Dabs House Road and Schillingford Drive. It was approved by the Board of Supervisors on November the 9th of last year. It's a project on 10.3 acres, and its proposed uses are 106 multifamily units and 28 for sale townhomes. And again, that's behind Carter Woods there at the Eastern Government Center. This project we refer to as Oliver Investment Funds, LLC. It's on South Kalmaya Avenue and East Beale Street. It's behind the new Highland Springs High School is the easiest way to think about it. Uh, this is being developed by the owners of some of the existing multifamily in that area. This was some green space that had been left from a previous project and also some uh, single family homes that had fallen into disrepair. Uh, this property owner stepped in, demolished those homes and uh, and propose this project as an upgrade to the area. It's 34 townhouses on 2.73 acres. This project, many of you are probably aware of, it was recently approved. It's uh, Bridleton SPE LLC is how we refer to it. It's a solar array on 234 acres. It's located on Gildale Road. Uh, it was approved by the Board of Supervisors on May 10th, 2022. Uh, there's what we refer to as a siting agreement that was put in place that's allowed by the Code of Virginia on this project. That siting agreement has been assigned to Dominion Power. So this is now a Dominion uh, Power facility. It is a 20 megawatt facility. Now we're moving into the pending cases. These are zoning cases that are pending, but action has not yet been taken by the board. 
The first one, which I'm sure many of you may be interested in, not too far from this location, it's REZ 2022-00026. It's Mark J. Cronenthal for East West Communities. It is a request to rezone uh, from A1 to suburban residential mixed planned development. The proposal is for approximately 1,000 residential dwelling units on 253 acres. Uh, this is, has been filed, it's been tabled. They owe us quite a bit of information right now. We do not have the full unit breakdown, but it will be a mixture of condominiums, townhomes, and single family development if uh, it finds approval from the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors. It is located at the intersections of Wilson Road and New Market Road. Again, it is pending. Uh, there is a community meeting scheduled for tomorrow evening. I would encourage all of you that are interested in this project to attend. This is the developer's community meeting. County representatives will be in attendance, but this is the developer's community meeting to hear from the community what you think about their proposed project. We'll be there, I'll have staff members there, your planning commissioner will be there to listen to what the input is from the community in regards to this proposal from East West. Uh, but it is tomorrow evening. It is at St. James Baptist Church. And I've got their letter right here. So it's Tuesday, October 4th, 6.30 at St. James Baptist Church. So if you're interested in this, please take the time to go by and listen to what the developer has to say about the project. You may hear information that we don't even have in our files at this time. We're still waiting on uh, transportation analysis and again, breakdowns on the units and different things like that. Two other pending cases, and there was recently a community meeting last week on the Ironwood Renewables LLC. This is a request for a solar array on 87 acres. It's located on Charles City, east of Turner Road. This is a less than 20 megawatt facility. It requires both a provisional use permit and a substantially in accord to be uh, recommended by the Planning Commission and final approval by the Board of Supervisors. It's currently pending for your October 13th Planning Commission meeting. Uh, it is a five megawatt, as I said, it is a smaller facility. The Bridleton facility was 20 megawatts. These facilities fall underneath the requirements of the state of Virginia for a siting agreement, which allows for certain controls that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we get through our provisional use permit process as well. But it, there are other things that are allowed by siting agreements that kick into place at 20 megawatts and above. This one's coming coming in below 20 megawatts. So the state code does not require that siting agreement with the locality. Uh, currently, there is a staff report online. Uh, it does not have a, a favorable recommendation from staff at this point. Also, uh, in, the, in the wings and waiting, it's been tabled currently. It may come forward in November. It's Labella and Associates. It is another five megawatt. Uh, facility, and it is in also for a provisional use permit and what we call substantially in accord. It is a solar array. It is on 96 acres. It is proposed at Charles City and Elko Roads near the intersection. So that one is tabled. We do have that in our files, but currently um, we have no new information on it, and it's not a complete application. And I will close out with plugging our comprehensive plan update. We are currently in the process of doing a lot of the uh, data gathering for our update on the 2026 plan. This will become our 2045 plan. The comprehensive plan, as many of you are aware, is the future master plan for the county. It's our guiding document and it touches on a lot of different areas. Uh, it touches on land use, which of course is uh, near and dear to my heart touches on natural resources of the county, public facilities and public facilities planning. So it ties into your capital improvements plans, which ties into your future bond issues. So you can see what the county's planning and what the growth in the county is going to bring as, as a need. Uh, it touches on rec and parks, transportation, and many other elements. We do have a website 
out it, that contains quite a bit of information. I would encourage you to visit that website, look at some of the data that we currently have posted. We have information on the residence survey and the rec and park survey that we conducted. We've got existing conditions reports that have been developed. We have information regarding our community visioning event that was held on March the 23rd. Uh, we have a draft bike plan that is posted. So please go and take a look at this website. Enter your email address so we can contact you and let you know what's going on. Uh, in December, when we meet with the Board of Retreat, we're going to be talking about more citizen engagement that will be coming in the early part of the year. We've got some really exciting things that I think you're going to want to get involved in. And of course, all your input helps us build this plan. So we're very excited about it. We look forward to working with you on it. But again, please go take a look at this website. There are some cards in the back of the room on the table has this information on it, pick one up, take a look at the website, put your information in so we can get in contact with you. And with that said, that's what I have for you this evening. I know it's a lot. Certainly I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you have or try to, and uh, I'll be here until the meeting's over as well. And just stay there for a second, just in case there's some questions. If real gets teed up for the last presentation, there was a question from uh, online about sour industrial um, building. I'm not sure you can answer it, but it's how many um, employees um, how many employees with a sour industrial building hold? Well, that's that's a little difficult to answer, Reverend Nelson, as you know, because that is, is speculative space. There are some employers that are located in some of the first phases of the project now, but it will vary depending upon what type of entity locates in it and how they split that space up. You could have someone come in that takes 200,000 square feet. You could have somebody that comes in and they partition off 15 or 20,000 square feet. So it's really hard to estimate. You have to know who that end user is, and we don't know that right now and what type of business they're actually in. And so usually um, we we get some type of, a, you know, if there is an end user, when there is an end user, we usually get some type of press announcement or something and yes, sir. they let us know how many employees, et cetera. So, yes, sir. And um, I can't get the information on the, the current entities that are in there and how many jobs are provided. All right, do that for me so that we can share that. Uh, also, where can residents see the recommendation? I don't know what this means, recommendation. Uh, I guess they mean the um, uh, the staff presentation. Can you just verify that? What, what recommendation, what does that mean? Um, planning staff offers an opinion, and then the planning commission votes, and then the board of supervisors votes according to what type of um, case it is. So, um, the staff opinion, where can you find a staff opinion for Ironwood? I'm so, there is no staff opinion for the bill because it's um, tabled, right? Correct. That's correct. But for Ironwood, there is a, uh, a staff report posted on our website. And uh, that goes through the entire project from our analysis standpoint. And it does have a staff recommendation attached to it. What, what's the, do you know the website, Joe, or do we just, do they just go to him right us and go to planning yes sir go to hitrico.us and then go to departments uh click on the drop down box click on planning when you get to the planning web page you can look on the left there will be a lot of a lot of different topics you'll see staff reports planning commission and you can do that drop down box and then click on that it'll take you directly to the staff reports for the planning commission, same thing for the board of supervisors. There's an upcoming board of supervisors meeting. Those staff reports are also posted for the board of supervisors. Thank you, sir. Questions. All right. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. Terrell is going to close us out with um, traffic, trucks, and speeding. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, good evening, everybody. So I'm Terrell Hughes, Director of Public Works. 
Uh, I know we had a question earlier. I can get with you later about Darby Town, but I will say just to everybody, um, you know, one thing, um, you know, as I've, I've been in this role for two years, so uh, we share the road with a lot of utilities. So some of it's our public utilities. And then in, in the, I guess in the instance of Darby Town Road, we share that with City Gas. So when they do a sewer line or, I mean, a sewer gas project update where they're running new service or they improve a service line, they will run a, as you've probably seen on Darby Town Road, they'll run a gash in the road. Um, we do require them to repave the lane once the project is complete. So, so they will completely, all of those areas that, um, you know, are ripped up, they're going to pave that lane over. So, um, sorry, it's taking so long. I guess the project's big and, and they, they'll, they really, they come out at the end of the project, uh, make sure everything has been accepted. So sorry for the delay on that. I have no control over that. Uh, it is city gas, but, um, we do, we do hold them accountable once they, once they pay. Uh, so I'm up here to talk about, I guess, traffic and uh, the truck study. So I'll, I'll get to the truck study um, in a bit, but I'll do a quick update. So last year, uh, we worked with the Board of Supervisors and we revised our, our traffic calming program. So you've, you're probably from, uh, you may be familiar with that, but it's been around since 2004. Uh, the program initially started in two phases. Phase one was if, you know, if there was speeding in, the na in a neighborhood. So this is typically your 25 mile an hour roads. Uh, we would, um, you could get signatures and then you could get a sign. The board would pass an ordinance and it would say $200 fine. If speeding still persisted a year later, you'd go back into the program, have to get signatures again, and then you would, you could get speed bumps. So we've actually revised the program. We've, we've really tried to take, make it a little bit less burdensome, make it a little bit easier to get into the program. Uh, we're no longer doing the $200 fine sign and we're going straight into what we call temporary traffic control devices or like the plastic speed cushions. Uh, we're also piloting out a number of other solutions, uh, such as uh, roundabouts. So there's a couple communities, like four mile um, run, where we've we've tried it out. Um, if they work, if the community wants to keep it, we'll look to to do a permanent roundabout. If the community doesn't like it, or if it's not effective, we can remove it. So, uh, so we're trying some new things out from a traffic calming standpoint. Um, you know, working with the chief and the police department. Uh, it's really difficult, you know, you kind of mentioned some of the crime statistics for our police officers. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're all over the place uh, serving the community and, and traffic, uh, you know, enforcement also falls under them. So, um, so from a public work side standpoint, what we're trying to do is, is partner with police and in installing some infrastructure to make it physically harder for cars to slow down, especially in our residential neighborhoods. Um, you know, they're, like I said, those are difficult areas to patrol. Uh, so by putting physical devices in place, this is, you know, targeted towards improving the safety of our of our pedestrians that that walk on the road, as well as the the people who live in the community. So this is, uh, you know, that has, that's actually probably one of the biggest, um, I guess, email items, complaints that I get, you know, just especially out in Verona is just the the traffic and the speeding. Uh, the other item that we we've done, I'll just mention. Uh, we have done an evaluation of a number of our speed limits around the county, so some of those are are being evaluated. Uh, the intent behind changing some of the speed limits or reducing um, or, or just adjusting some of the speed limits is in response to just some of the increases in crashes. Uh, we've, you know, it's been a number of years since a lot of the roads have been looked at. A lot of the characteristics I'll get into with the truck study. We've got roads that are curvy, windy, narrow. Um, and just sort of looked at a lot of the crash statistics, statistics around the county. We were trending up on pedestrian fatalities. Um, you know, that's something that that uh, we're trying to reverse the trend on. And, um, you know, a number of roads have, uh, we're adding pedestrian accommodations and, um, you know, just adjusting some of the speeds as a result of that. So you'll see some speed changes um, in the area. Um, you know, we've done really, I think it's over 100 roads over the last 18 months. And, um, you know, this is really to, overall drop speeds. So, you know, speeding still going to occur, you know, this, um, but, you know, as when we start looking at statistics of roads that we've dropped speeds, the typical user of the road is going to follow and obey the speed limit. And we do see overall speeds reduced, which is, which is from my standpoint, the goal, um, like I said, not, not necessarily from a ticketing standpoint, um, but we are doing a number of things. We're, we're constantly working with police. We, we have a quarterly meeting where our staff, my staff, his staff, they, they meet, they go over crash statistics and they try to identify uh, you know, safety improvements and things that we can do to reverse the trend. And we also constantly meet with VDOT. That's one of the other areas that, um, you know, especially out here in Verona, uh, Williamsburg Road, Airport Airport Drive, um, the uh, Nine Mile Road. Uh, there are a number of, uh, even Route 5, um, 
those those are all VDOT maintained facilities. So uh, we have a little we have a lot less say over what goes there, uh, but we do have to coordinate with VDOT as well. Um, and then if speeding wasn't the top complaint, I think one of the other areas from a public work standpoint has just been truck traffic, especially out here in Eastern Henrico. Um, you know, so rather than looking at trucks on a street by street basis, um, because we get so many complaints, what we did is we took pretty much half the county, as Mr. Nelson said, you know, Verona is about half the county. Uh, this covers a little bit of Fairfield district, but, um, and we did an Eastern Henrico truck study. So this was something that was identified, I think, in the last community meeting that I was at earlier this year. Um, and this is sort of a follow up on that study. Um, so I'm going to kind of fly through this a little bit, but we'll make this available online for those that want to share um, to share this. Uh, but really, the primary goal was to sort of what we did is we we identified a, a number of roads throughout the county. Um, so I have a number of slides that really kind of walk through the process. Um, we wanted to identify whether we had truck traffic on roads, whether truck traffic should be on those roads. So is that a road suitable for truck traffic? And then should there be a recommendation done on that? So that's kind of the general overview um, uh, of the study. Uh, but first we looked at what we would call our freight generators. So we wanted to know how trucks are getting to, and really there are two primary industrial centers here in Verona. There's a, a industrial area over near the airport, and then there's an industrial area over at White Oak Technology Park. So these are the two primary generators of truck traffic, and we wanted to know really how are trucks getting uh, there's a number of stars. Joe kind of mentioned a, a number of developments um, that are approved or kind of on the way. Uh, a lot of those uh, kind of concentrate around uh, Laburnum. Um, so we did we did do some analysis on where truck traffic, you know, should be going. So most of the, you know, we've been blessed with a lot of highways out here in Eastern Henrico, especially uh, with 295, 895. Uh, we also have William, um, 64. There's Williamsburg Road Route 60. Uh, there's Laburnum. So there are a number of roads that are, are set up to handle trucks. And that's really where most of the trucks that are accessing those sites are using. Uh, but we, um, well, I'll, I'll get to that. We do have some trucks on some roads that aren't as suitable. Uh, but first we did, uh, we, with our engineering team, did a full analysis, drove every road, took measurements on the widths of the road, noted curves, noted uh, rail crossings, um, you know, and, and identified whether a road should, is suitable or unsuitable for truck traffic. So I'll give an example of a road that's unsuitable. So Darby Town Road, drive out Darby Town Road. At some point, as you're headed towards the city, there's a 12 foot height uh, warning uh, for that rail crossing, not suitable for trucks. Typically, you want at least 16 feet uh, for a safe truck clearance. So, so that in that particular case, that would be a route deemed unsuitable for truck traffic. Uh, so we did that on a number of roads that were, whether it was narrow, curvy, and um, and identified truck tra uh, roads that weren't suitable. And then we took counts across Eastern Henrico and identified where trucks actually, which roads had truck traffic. So there are a number of roads that aren't necessarily included in our recommendation because we just didn't measure a lot of truck traffic um, or a significant amount of truck traffic. But there are some roads where there was a cross reference between significant truck traffic and unsuitable uh, conditions. So we kind of highlighted a number of them. Uh, Doran, Strath, there's Willis Church Road, Charles City Road, there was a stretch of Charles City Road, uh, Turner Road, Poplar Springs Road, um, and, and that stretch of Darby Town that I mentioned. So those are some roads that had significant truck traffic that we deemed unsuitable. Um, so this is just a map. We do have a number of restrictions throughout the uh, Eastern Henrico already. So um, I just list this for, for purposes saying, you know, we're not recommending a restriction on a road that already has a restriction. Um, and then we wanted to identify, okay, if we restrict routes, what, what is the say, what is the truck route? What is the route that trucks are going to go? So we do have a number of routes on here, like Willis Church Road, Elko Road. Um, those are still on there. Those are VDOT maintained facilities. Do we don't have any, uh, our, the board doesn't have the ability to restrict trucks on those roads, Route 5. Um, we do have a number of um, routes, though, that are suitable, Laburnum, all of the highways, uh, Route 60, uh, and this does serve the majority of the trucks that are going to access those industrial areas. Um, and then we looked at identifying a couple potential locations for what we call wayfinding signs or signs that we're going to work with VDOT to install to, rec to try to send trucks up other routes. So, um, you know, one example would be to kind of put like a put a sign to, to ignore your GPS drive, drive through, um, 
you know, so that trucks aren't necessarily using Willis Church Road. We do get a number of complaints about the curve on that road. Um, so this long list here, this is actually the list of routes uh, that we are recommending for truck restrictions. I think some of the most significant ones are stretches of, of Charles City Road, not the not its entirety. Uh, but there's a stretch between Elko Road and the Charles City County line that is really the origin of where a lot of trucks come into uh, the other portions of the county, um, as well as just a number of other um, restrictions to, to sort of are targeted to get trucks off of the narrow roads. Um, I will note that this is up on October 11th. So this is a, it's going to be, I guess, a new ordinance would have to be passed by the Board of Supervisors. So uh, the first meeting of the month, uh, this will be up for a public comment um, and up for board action, uh, this list of, of streets. So with that, I'll leave the list up a little longer, but there, is there time to take questions? Are there any questions? I do have one online that speaks to um, four mile run. We need to talk about that, I guess. We got a complaint about that last week and I just got another one. So um, some very specific things um, of a person that I forwarded your email. So I just wanna make sure I said that publicly so that me and you can talk about what their um, challenges are. Any questions? Yes. Mr. Nelson, I um, called your office about two years for the roads on New Market and First Colonial. And I think I had talked to Mr. Hughes. The first year they told me they couldn't get to it because of the virus. Understandable. The second year I called, this year, I called in February. And they said by spring, we'd be out there working on your roads. Nothing happened. First Colonial. New Market Road. I know, I know Rough Avenue, where is First Colonial as well? The first house on, you come in off Laberta into um, New, um, First Colonial, um, Old Colony. Old okay. Colony. Okay. okay, okay. Right there. All right. And so, go ahead. I'd like to know how often will street cleaners come through the street to clean the streets? You said street sweeping? So we, we do that on request. So on I can request. I can get your information, but. Um, we currently don't have a regular rotation. We do street sweeping on request right now, just mainly due to staffing. Um, so if you have a street sweeper request, you can call the Department of Public Works. But I, I'm, I'm, I'll stick around. I can get your okay, information. Okay, got one more question. My wife told me to ask you this. Can we get more lighting on Route 5? You said Route 5. Yeah, so Route 5 is, uh, once again, like I said, it's a VDOT facility. So anything would have to be sort of worked through them. Um, I think they might find some challenges with lighting on Route 5, maybe even just from a, uh, just the way the county developed. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of dark, I call it dark sky uh, folks. So anytime you propose lighting, you're going to have a group. So I think that would be a bigger discussion, honestly. So... Let's let's do this. Let's because I don't I haven't engaged VDOT about lighting on Route Five since I've been in office. So let's let's see what happens. So Route Five, Route Five, Williamsburg Road, Nine Mile Road, they're all state roads. So right. that, those are not roads that we can just go in and do stuff without either the state offering permission or them doing it themselves. So you tell your wife that's a good question and let us engage, all right? Now, you you two get together, and my man, because I know you were talking about Darbytown Meadows, Darbytown Road. All right, so we got to make sure we get... Darbytown Meadows is a subdivision off of Darbytown Road, all right? Yes, ma'am, you had a question? I was wondering if you... Oh, I was wondering if you could, like, widen the road for, for a bike lane, is that possible? Because there are a lot of bikers that ride up and down that um, Darbytown Road. You said on um, Darbytown Road? Just yeah. to piggyback, it's dangerous yes. trying to get from our subdivision to the bike trail. Mm -hmm. And why could we have a lane down Darbytown that would take us around to that or somewhere? So, because it's dangerous, we don't do it. It's, it's just dangerous. Okay. A lot of bikers. Yeah, that's a good question. So we're um, we're currently working with planning. So they're working on the, the 2045 plan. As part of the 2045 plan, we we actually have a bike plan. So that's actually publicly available. Well, I was going to say, I well, think the, well, the plan. Oh, it, yeah. yeah. The, so the plan is just a plan to guide us. And it, it 
what the 45 just speaks to future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. like we were working off of the 2026 plan in 2011. So that we, it'll take us what, Joe, like two years maybe for the comp plan. What is it? Yeah. So it'll be the development plan. And then once the plan is straight, it will guide us for the next two decades. Yeah. yeah. You were going, let me go back. Let me go back to my man in the back first. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me, I'll it's, finish it's answering to the, uh, we are we are starting to implement some of the draft bike plan though, but I, I just mentioned that so that if you can go online, uh, if you get the twenty forty five card, that way you can check out the map. Okay, yeah. Yeah, regarding the truck restrictions, uh, you kind of quickly went through the process that that's going to require. Uh, could you get a little bit more detailed and where can I find more information about uh, citizen input for that? Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So. This will be this information is going to be located on the, the Board of Supervisors page. So if you go to the Henrico website, uh, there's details on the next Board of Supervisors meeting. So th because this is coming up on the next Board of Supervisors meeting, that uh, updated ordinance information will be posted there. And then um, we'll also on the Verona Community Conversations page, we'll make sure that this presentation is made available. That's just a public comment, right? Well, no, I think it'll actually be for action. So the introduction of the ordinance was the the last meeting. Well, first meeting in September. So right. this has been advertised in the, the Richmond Times Dispatch. So prior to the board taking action, there's a, a public meeting, uh, a public comment period. So uh, once this gets presented, there's an opportunity for the public to either speak for or against the. Restriction. So if you. Okay. So once you look at it, I'm going to give you my card, give you my number. You got questions, comments. I get all your questions answered before we vote. Okay. How, how will the proposed truck restrictions affect uh, farm and seasonal farm and forestry trucks? So uh, that's a good question as well. So the, the truck restriction is a through truck restriction, so it doesn't necessarily apply. So I'll just use an example. If a delivery truck is going to deliver to a home along that, a residence on that road, the through truck restriction wouldn't apply because at this point they're serving a local route. Uh, same thing would apply if, it, if a logging activity were to occur. Uh, the, the through truck restriction wouldn't apply because the truck actually is serving something on that road. So, so same thing with farming. So the, the through truck restriction wouldn't apply because the farming activity would be local. And, and as you notice, we have installed, uh, I think earlier this year, um, it was through, through comments, uh, from the rec we received from the public. We did install some share the road signs, uh, because we do have a lot of, uh, farm use vehicles. Uh, especially throughout Eastern Henrico. All right. Any other questions for real? Got one more. Yes. Yes. I am walking myself today in my calories. Good evening, sir. I was uh, just like to bring up at Mill Road and five. A street light there would be a big help. That is a very dark turn. There's electricity there. There's a pole there. All you do is need to slap a light right up there on the pole. Okay. Thank you, All right, meal and five. Got it. You know, uh, we got to talk to V dot about it. Yes. Yep. All right. Thank you. I told you it was a lot. I told you it wouldn't take two hours. I, I was wrong. It did take two hours. So, but I hope that you guys um, got your questions answered as it relates to the related topics. Anything that uh, we didn't talk about tonight that you may have a question about. All right. Well, like we say in church, all hearts and minds are clear. Uh, hold on. Joe is, uh, has a comment. Everyone go. I did get an answer on the job creation at Sauer Center. Currently, it's 450 and there's still space to be filled. And that's an approximate. Number. All right. So Sauer online 450 and there's still space to be filled. So it could be more than that. All right. All right, guys. Thank you. And I know Terrell is hanging around. Joe is here. Um, Monica's here as we head out. Um, Chief is here. If you have any questions, then you can ask them on, on our way out. Thank you.